Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together with believers. We ask you to be with us now during this time as we uh, have your word uh, brought to us and instruction provided, Father, that we can not only um, absorb what you have from us from your word and from the teacher that you have provided, but, Father, from the context of talking to each other as believers. Father, we thank you for your love expressed to us through your son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Get this rolling and share my screen. So let me know when you guys have that on the screen. Yeah, I'm not up for fun. And I'm going to share sound. All right, we should be good to roll here. Let me go ahead and put play now. Let me know when you guys can hear it. Yeah. Hey friends, welcome back to our study in 1 Peter. We are in our second session. And as we look at this session, we are gonna still be in chapter one. We're gonna start in verse 13. And for this particular study, we're going to walk all the way through, reference at least, chapter two, verse three. Uh, we're gonna recognize a third element when it comes to how Peter orients the identity of these believers. If, if you remember back from our last session, we said that Peter wants to help them discover not only who they are as God's people, but also where they're going, how to live in this world of uncertainty. And so he over and over again reminds them of him or points to God and, and reminds them of his identity what God has done in his foreknowledge, who, what the Holy Spirit is doing in his sanctification of them, what Jesus has done through his sprinkling of blood, through his suffering, through his resurrection as they obey him. So it's an orienting truth that Peter uses throughout. The, the second one we mentioned is history, is that Peter again and again, remember 30 Old Testament allusions, 25 from the gospel, he's going to remind them of their story. Where are they from? And therefore, who are they right now and where are they going? And he also over, again, over and over again reminds them of this hope. He calls it a living hope. And he points them to the future and says, this is our destination. This is where we're going. So maintain your bearing. Maintain your identity as exiles in this world, as you wander through this world, as you are tempted to lose your identity, as you're tempted to blend in with the world, you maintain your bearings by orienting yourself to these three orienting truths, him, history, and hope. In this section, really in this session, as well as in the next session, we're gonna discover a fourth word, but it's important for us to put it in perspective to these first three, because it really comes out of these first three. We're gonna discover that they are, over and over again, Peter is going to remind them that they are to be a holy people. And so this, this can be considered an orienting truth as well, but, but I want to put it in its right place because it's only because of who he is and what he has done redeeming us and rescuing us, his resurrection and his promises and the hope that we have. It's only because of this paradigm, this framework, that we come to the place where we need to live out our identity that identity that's already established. We're gonna discover that we don't attain holiness, but it's attributed to us. It's given to us because of who we are in him and through this story. So we're gonna discover that Peter throughout this section, throughout chapter one, verse 13, all the way through chapter two, verse three, and really kind of leading on throughout the rest of the letter, that Peter's gonna remind them that they as exiles in this land that's not theirs, in the culture, that's not identified with who he is in this history and this hope, they are called to live distinctively. They're called to live as his people. So we're going to talk about this theme of holiness. And I recognize that this word comes with some baggage for some of us. That for some of us, holiness was something we attained to rather than something that was attributed to us. So we, we want to think of it this way. This is perhaps the best way I could think of it. Um, I have here a pair of gloves. Now, to be honest, they're just ordinary gloves. In fact, I pulled them out of a box in my attic the other day and handed them over to my 10, getting ready to turn 11-year-old son. He at first looked at the gloves and was like, 
kind of, ooh, gross. Like, these are some old gloves, dad. Why are you giving me these gloves? But then I told him who these gloves belonged to. Uh, these gloves were gloves that belonged to a tight end who played in the NFL with Peyton Manning. Oh, that sets these gloves apart as distinct. They are something completely different in his mind now that they are framed up with a new identity of him not being God, but being this tight end. He happens to be um, Joel Dreesen, who played for the Texans and the Denver Broncos. Uh, I played high school football with him, which says nothing about my ability to play football. But he gave these gloves to my mom to give to me. We were in Fellowship of Christian Athletes together. So now these gloves have a paradigm of him and a history. They had some hope, but you know what I'm saying. The, the, the illusion breaks down at some point, but they are set apart. They are distinct. And my, my son that day wanted to wear these to the Friday night high school football game where we live in Web City. These gloves, because of who they belong to and who they were used by, who found them useful, had a distinct, different element associated with them. Maybe that's a poor analogy, but here's what we find in the Bible is that it is common things in the Bible that are used by God and therefore are attributed because of their usefulness by him and their use from him. They're attributed an element of his holiness. Uh, look, look what I mean. Look throughout the, the Old Testament. Ordinary dirt and an ordinary bush. And when Moses walks there, God says, take off your sandals for the place where you were standing is holy ground. Now, what was it that was, you know, about the dirt, intrinsic about the dirt or the ground or the bush that was there? N nothing. What did they do to attain holiness? They did absolutely nothing to attain holiness. That holiness was attributed because of the fact that it was used by God. God's presence was manifested there. I believe God is always present, but he manifested his presence there. That's what made them holy. A tent in the wilderness made of goat skin. What was it about the tent? The acacia wood? Maybe it was the gold. Surely it was the gold. No. It was because God used that place and those elements. And because God used them and because of who he is, and because God was using them in history and pointing forward in hope, those things were attributed his holiness. They were made holy. What about the people of Israel? What was it about them? Was it the fact that they carried out these sacrifices? No, no, no. It was that God made them holy because of his identity. So it is important for us to, to realize how these elements fit together. But over and over again, Peter is going to say, we are called to be his holy people as we wander through this land as an elect group of exiles in the dispersion. So notice what, what Peter says as we begin our text today. He's going to start in chapter 1, verse 13. There's a hinge text here. He's going to say, therefore, there's the hinge, because of everything that happened in the first 12 verses, because of the identity of him, the history, and the hope that we've seen, therefore, get ready. We've already mentioned this in the first session. Prepare your minds for action. Gird up your garments. Get ready to run. Get ready to work. Be sober-minded and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then verse 14 starts this theme. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but instead, as he who called you is holy, you also, in all of your conduct, because it is written, you are holy because he is holy. A couple things about this text. Peter is going to use two metaphors to talk about holiness. The first metaphor is the, the metaphor of a child or of children. We are his children. And part of the reason why we live as a wholly distinct people is because we're part of his family. In fact, there's going to be a contrasting in our session today of two families. One is the family of our forefathers that we come from before our identity is reshaped in him. He's going to talk about a new birth. He already has mentioned that we're born again. So today we're going to study this particular, uh, this particular metaphor in chapter 1, verses 13 through chapter 2, verse 3. Then in our next session, in chapter 2, verse 4 through 12, we're going to discover that we are his, not children, but we are his temple. And we are built together as living stones as a part of this temple. And really a part of that is that we're also priests. He, he somewhat uh, conflates these two concepts together. We're both the temple and the priests as we serve 
in, in this capacity as God's people, but all of these fleshing out this idea of our identity as a holy people. So let's look back at this particular passage, verses 14 all the way through 16. Peter says, we are obedient children. We've already seen in verse one that we are a people in exile who are called for the obedience of Jesus who sprinkled us by his blood. And we mentioned that that word obedience is to hear, but not only to listen and hear audibly, but to also then treat Jesus, to respond to Jesus as our Lord. So obedient children are those who listen. This same word is going to be used later on in verse 22 of chapter 1, and it's going to lead us to brotherly love. As his children, when we obey him, it leads us to love one another. It shapes our identity as his holy people. So as obedient children, he says, do not be conformed. That word conformed, we get our word schematic. When it comes to this concept of how do we pattern our lives, how do we orient ourselves? No, we come back to these orienting truths. Who is he? Therefore, how should we live as his children? What has he done in the past in our lives? What's our story? My, my kids know that there are stories that we tell in our family and they shape us. They shape our identity as a family and they shape who we are becoming as a family. So what's our story as his children? What's our hope? What, what is on our, our inheritance? Peter has used this language and will use it again. We have an inheritance that's unfading. It's imperishable. No, we have an inheritance as his children in, in our hope. And so how does that identity cause us to live as his holy people? Well, we are obedient and we don't conform. There's that word schematic. We get our word schematic. We don't conform ourselves to the patterns of this world, but instead, but instead, because we know him, we're not ignorant to who he is. That word ignorance, we get our word agnostic from that word or not knowing because we know him because we're not agnostic about him, we know him, it shapes our identity as a holy people. And then Peter quotes from Leviticus chapter 11, 19 and 20, and he says, be holy, not because you need to earn anything, but because of your relationship, your connection with the Father, because of your connection with him. We obey, we are holy, because of what we believe about the Father. He's good, we can trust him, he, he loves us, he's wise. So we align ourselves to him, not to attain holiness, but because it was attributed to us from him in mercy and in grace. We obey because we want to be like him, because we want to be like the father, because we love him. And so Peter goes on in verse 17 and says, and if you call on him as father, this father who judges with impartiality according to each one's deeds, then conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile as you're away from home, if God is your father, then conduct yourself with fear, uh, knowing that as you live out this life, you're going to be held to account that God judges with impartiality. In other words, because of who he is and his history and his hope, you can know this. God doesn't look to one person and think that they're above another. We are all his children. So we conduct ourselves in the same way as we discover who he is. He treats us with mercy. He treats us with grace. He treats us with forgiveness. And this connects with what we see as a theme throughout the entire Bible is that God's people, because of what he has done for them, redeeming them, God calls them to be more like him in their ways. Peter says, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your exile, knowing that you were ransomed. This is a story of holiness because of grace. For the Old Testament people, God reminds them again and again, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. Now we look to the cross of Jesus. I brought you out of sin. You were ransomed from the feudal ways of your forefathers that you inherited from them. Peter has mentioned our history. We have an inheritance that is never going to fade. It's imperishable. But Peter also says, but you have another history. You have another family. And in this family line, you inherited some feudal ways. There are some empty things that you inherited. And so he reminds us of this, of this inheritance of our forefathers, these feudal ways. And it's in contrast to the things that we inherit from God the Father. And throughout this text, Peter contrasts these two inheritances. Which one do you want to inherit as God's people? Do you want to inherit this inheritance that never fades? Or this inheritance as the people of this world? An inheritance that is feudal, that is empty, that is temporary. 
when I was originally studying this text a number of months ago, I asked my kids, hey, what is it about dad that you want to inherit, that you want to be like? And to be honest, when I asked the question, it was during a season of life where I was a little afraid of their answer. But the reality is my kids will inherit some things from me as a person who is broken and flawed and sinful that I'd rather them not inherit. Some futile, empty things. But I'm also thankful and in hope look forward to the fact that they will also inherit from God the Father, an inheritance that will never spoil or fade, that their identity will be reshaped as God's holy people because of the story that we share in Jesus. Peter has this story and he says, you were ransomed, not with perishable things. You weren't bought out of that slavery, out of Egypt with perishable things such as silver or gold, but in our case, from our sin. Verse 19 says, you were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. When it comes to our value as his children, we recognize that you are worth whatever someone is willing to pay for you. And this ransom, this, this price that was paid by God was the blood of Christ, the sacrificial lamb. There's that Exodus metaphor coming out again. He brings us out of Egypt. In this case, he brings us out of sin because of the blood of Christ. You wanna know how much you're worth to God? Look again to him. He sprinkled us. He ransomed us. He redeemed us. He rescued us. This is more than silver or gold. This is the precious blood of Jesus. This is the lamb who did not have a blemish or a spot. He was completely holy. You want to talk about our holiness? It's attributed to us because of his holiness, not because we attained it. And so what do we do? We align ourselves to it. We align ourselves to it and we live out this identity that was attributed to us as his children. This says Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has been made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. Why? Because who through him, your believers in God, this God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in him. Peter realigns them. He brings this back and he recircles back to it. And he says, you want to align yourself to this? So purify your souls by your obedience to the truth. This is attributed holiness, but we align ourselves to it. We become obedient to it. We listen to Jesus. We become obedient to the truth. And what does that result in? A love for one another. This becomes a brotherly love, a love from a pure heart, Peter says, verse 22. He says, we do this because we have been born again. We have a new family. We have a new identity. And this is not a perishable family. It's from imperishable seed. It's from the living and abiding word of God. We have a living hope, but this is a living and abiding word of, word of God. He quotes from Isaiah 40. He says, I know all flesh is like grass. All, all flesh is like flowers. They fade, they perish, but the word of God remains forever. This is good news for you. Because of him, because of his history, because of our hope, we become holy but we also have this identity that will never spoil or fade. So we align ourselves to this holiness as his children. So chapter two, verse one. So put away, that metaphor there is to change clothes. Put away malice and deceit and hypocrisy, being fake. Put away envy and slander. And like newborn infants, recognize children again, like newborn infants, long for, crave, desire, pure, spiritual, this word could be logical as well, pure spiritual milk, milk that makes sense. What is that milk? It's the word of God. It's God speaking into your life in your new birth and recreating you in his image. Notice what it says. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk so that by it, you may grow up into salvation. You may grow up into this identity of who you are as God saved people. For Peter, salvation is not just in the future, it's in the present. It's part of our identity of who we are now. In verse three, he says, if indeed you have tasted, quoting from Psalm 34, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You see, as Peter frames this up, when it comes to our identity, his children, he asks the question at the end. So are you growing to become more like him as his children? Let me ask you this question over the last month, maybe last six months. Can I ask you this question over the last year? Put a timeline on it. How have you grown? Have you grown? How would you chart that? If we were to chart your growth over the last period of time, whatever the time frame you want to put on that, how would you measure your growth? 
Well, it kind of depends on what elements you use to, to chart this, doesn't it? Would you say, oh, I've grown because I've, uh, I've, I've graduated high school, graduated college, I've started a new career, got a raise, I've lost weight, I've gained weight, I've had a family, I've gotten married, I have a relationship. How would you chart how you have grown? You see, for Peter, as he frames up our identity, here's what he says. How have you grown is defined in, have you become more like him? As God's children, we know that a child that doesn't grow is not healthy. We know that. And it grieves us. But it should grieve us when we are not growing as his children to become more like him. So Peter defines this and he puts this paradigm out there for us. And he says, so are you growing? Are you craving his word? Are you desiring to know him more, know his story more, know his hope more, become more holy, to become more like him as his children? Because here's what happens, and we'll see this in our next session. When you look more like him, the world looks at you and the world doesn't see you and is not just impressed by you, but they see him and it results in that praise and that glory and in the identification of who God is. And it points people to him rather than to you. Grow up and be more like Jesus. Thoughts? It's good. I like, I like how he just breaks it down really nicely. I really like the connection of holy and, and an item being used by God. Yeah, I, th I thought the glove analogy was, um, was a good analogy to grasp that, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, the other thing that popped into my head was, um, oh, there's a song about it. There's a poem about it. The old violin thing. Anybody know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, what, what's it worth? Well, you know, it, it becomes what it's worth in the master's hand, right? Right. Wayne Watson. Yeah, yeah. Wayne Watson. I was trying to think who it was. We're all we're all we're all old school enough to know that. So, uh, right. <laughs> um, and by the way, uh, Bill is Mickey there with you? Uh, no, I'm solo today. Okay, I've been bad. I, I get scolded most Mondays because I haven't turned in attendance. So I'm going to do a good job of doing it while we're still here and online, so I don't forget to do it. So um, I was I was trying to be there, Bill, but uh, we had Andrew and the kids over the weekend. And he left a little later than I thought he would, so I didn't quite, quite wasn't quite able to get there, so. How are you feeling? You, your sinus is uh, doing better? No, and I happened to get, well, we can talk about this later. Yeah. Since we're recording. <clears throat> So the, again, the word holy, uh, what, what, are, what are the definitions you're familiar with and you've heard about holy? Bill, you just referenced the one there in terms of becomes holy because of God's, you know, use of it or God's presence in it. Being set apart. Being set apart, right. What, what are the connotations of holy normally when we, when we hear that term used? What does it bring to mind beyond, beyond what it means? What does it bring to mind? I think for some, it might mean perfection. Okay. Sacred. Sacred is a good um, synonym for that. <coughs> Holy. Yeah. 
holy ground, sacred ground, that's holy, that's sacred. For me, it always carries, and this is an appropriate thing that it would carry, but for me, it always carries that idea of um, not being, it should not be approached, or it's less approachable, if that makes any sense. You yeah. know, this, again, that, that's that separateness thing, that, that's holy, you know, that, that's holy ground. Again, it's, you know, you can, well, the holy of holies. The holy of holies. You know, in, in my head, I get this sort of, you know, the I get the roped off, you know, place you're not supposed to go kind of thing, which I think is a correct element to get of that. But um, I think that sometimes that brings us into the thinking that, you know, of what I think when I get that brought into my head, what I then suddenly forget that I need to remember is that God has made a way for me to have entrance to it. He has nothing I've done, but he has. But yet, but yet, what you're saying is it, it should not it should not be approached flippantly. Right, right. And you know, it's like you know. Um, well, I, I was I saw something this week, something that was purely historical. I can't remember what it was, but it was you know something about a Roman emperor at some point, and literally, you know, someone being put to death because they had touched they had touched like a not, not like what like his scepter or something like that but it touched like his favorite toy horse or something like that where and, and he was put to death because you had touched something that was the emperor's and you know that so that's you know that's sort of this other extreme thing that was in my head but yet when you think about the holy of holies the reference that kathy made you know what would happen if all of the right process procedure and <laughs> and um sacrifices and everything wasn't were done properly what would happen to the priest when he went in there you know there, there was a reason they had bells on the robe or you know i was thinking about the the, the the ark when it you know they were improperly transporting it on the ox cart and that you know someone with right motive reaches up to to steady it but touches it which was not proper you know, you know the story there is that you know they were they were transporting it improperly that's part of the lesson there but just you know that's the idea what you know gets in mind here with holiness for me and i have to sometimes think through yes that's right but what does that mean in terms of how it applies um i particularly like can you guys see on the screen the thing from the pdf yeah Okay. The outline? The outline, yeah. So you notice the three points there. Our identity in the world should reflect our relationship in God. When you when I read that statement, what comes to mind for you? <laughs> well, if our identity is in him, then everything about our life should reflect that we are in union with him. Okay. Our purposes, our decisions, our behavior, our relating to other people, et cetera. I thought it was interesting to me. It didn't click to me now until I just read it, but the choice of um, the preposition in God, in God versus mm -hmm. to God or with God. Try to think what other prepositions could have gone there okay. with to. Um, <clears throat> I'm presuming that was a very intentional choice. I would say so. I I know for me. In recent years, I've been doing more study on the, the doctrine of the union with Christ. And that, to me, is language um, of that. Yeah, it's, it's not... Um... It's that union thing. We, we, we're not just, we're not, con, we are connected. We're, and we're connected in a way that is really connected, right? Right. Q, 
Do you think of yourself as holy? Only because of the holiness attributed to me in Christ. Is anybody else like me where you struggle with even applying that? I guess a question of, you know, I, get, I understand that intellectually, but I, I still don't feel worthy of that kind of thing. Sorry, it humbles you. Sorry, sorry, I just saw your chat. I mean to ignore it. I mean to ignore it. Um, this idea of the two families that he talks about here. Um, first of all, who are these two families that he makes reference to? <laughs> the family of God and the family of origin. Right. So, so the suggestion here is that we inherit things from both of those families, right? Right. Um, I think we've all probably heard this sermon illustration, particularly in Roman adoption, is that in Roman adoption, <laughs> as I understand it, you could you can dis uh, once you adopted someone in Roman law, you basically could not undo that. You actually could disown your own biological child, but you could not disown someone that was adopted in quite the same way. And so that that family of choice that came to be, which is how, you know, we see um, our relationship through the New Testament. You know, we are adopted, we are co-heirs adopted with Christ is one thing, but then we actually do have our, our natural genetic Make up as well, and what we what do we inherit from our from our family of origin and through our genetic makeup? Well, the spirit, the oh, thing we inherit is is is, is sin, correct? <clears throat> right. So, how do those two things balance each other? So we, so we have like the fall of Adam. We're all part of that fallen nature. And then there's that redemption. You know, when Christ died, we're redeemed. We are holy, not by ourselves and not by the flesh, but by the spirit. You know, that holiness comes to us. And so and while I don't feel holy because I'm still in this human fleshly body and full of sin, it doesn't mean that I'm not holy because God has created me holy and blameless through Christ's blood, I just haven't been able to fully experience it yet because I'm not in a state of that purity because I'm still in this flesh. Those are my thoughts anyway. And so does that create for, for me, when I think through that, and I agree with everything you just said there, Lori, for me, that creates this thing sometimes in my head of dissonance, you know, holding those two things in, in tension at the same time, you know, sometimes makes my head hurt a little bit. Well, yeah, of course. Um, it's really difficult in the everyday right now, knowing what we live through every moment, if especially if we don't spend time renewing ourselves in the, in the presence of the Lord and 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 engaging in the the things that we need just to feed that spiritual component, it really is difficult. And I, and I think that that's why Peter is going to the point that he is there because he knows just how much 
they need to be reminded that they are important and they are valued. And we need it as well, all the time, because of it's so often easy. You know, we don't want to get to that place where we're full of pride and going, oh, I'm just so holy, you know. But we really need to, to know that we are holy. But at the same time, we're still living out our sanctification on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Yeah, it's It should tough. humble us. Yes, it's so tough. <laughs> In fact, the holiness should produce the humility, which produces the holiness, which should produce the humility. Exactly. And, you know, round and round and round the circle goes, right? Yeah. I, I was also just, I was thinking and struck here by a lot of you that, that identity thing of, there was, um, I've, I've been adding titles and roles and responsibilities at work over the last couple of months in such a way that I've had to change my signature block on the bottom of my emails. And so I, I came to a question the other day, instead of putting them all out horizontally, they, they're vertical, which should be on top of the other. In other words, which is, which is the primary, second? Well, it, it actually depends on who I'm talking to as to which of those, you know, quote unquote titles or positions or whatever, you know, roles, whatever noun you want to ascribe to them is important. So much so that one of my coworkers, one of the other managers in our office here, uh, two times this week started a call with, uh, you know, uh, I'm calling, I'm calling for the managing director, which was his way of saying we're about to have one type of conversation versus I'm calling for a sales VP. You know, it was it was his way of saying what the topic of our conversation was about to be about. Well, he was calling for me. I'm all of those things, you know, at the, at the same time. But what he was saying was the role that I need you to be in right now for the conversation we're about to have is this, not the other. By the way, these things can't be separated out. And I, I was thinking about that as, you know, as a real world example of, um, you know, what's happening here. We, we, we are all of these things at the same time collectively, and yet we sometimes want to separate them out as if there's something that can be separated. Kathy's about to leave to take her on the church, so. Um, Hi, guys. I was just looking over it, it in Second Peter chapter one verse three. It says, "His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of Him who's called us by His own glory and goodness." I think some translations say everything we need for a holy life. But so you know, we may not view ourselves as holy, but He's given us everything we need to be that way. Right. And I, you know, this, this is where the rubber meets the road for me in our, in our modern, in our modern world and modern Christianity. Yeah, you know, I think there are times that we go, there's no, I, no way I even deserve to have the word holy cast in my general direction. Well, that's true. I don't deserve that, period. That, that part is true. But I, but I but I I am made holy, or, or holiness is being imparted to me because of Christ. We understand the source of it, but then we actually, and I think this is one of the the, the things of the modern church that we have to guard against. Uh, sometimes we go. There is an element in, the, in in of modern believers that goes the other way. We are holy. We know best. We are in a position. We've talked about this, but we're in a position where we can judge because we are we are holy, and. Uh, I think it's that, you know, that tension is one of the other tensions that exists out there for me that I think that's, um, that's a challenge. Well, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's true that God has given us everything we need to be holy, but I have to be careful with that kind of language because I will look at that as acts of service or works that I need to perform to, to be holy when I'm still, you know, again, I'm still not fully perfect because I'm still here in the flesh, but I am still holy as well. So it's not that I am performing to maintain or gain that holiness. I mean, I'm still continuing to grow and develop, but that's not what makes me holy. I am already holy. I'm just not experiencing it in its fullness yet. Yeah. I think, Laura, you're the one that mentioned, or 
perhaps it was Donna, so I want to make sure I attribute it rightly, that idea of we are saved and yet we are still working out our salvation. You know, that, that that's another similar type of tension there. You know, I'm not earning my salvation because it's impossible for me to earn my salvation. But that doesn't mean that there's not a salvation, that there's not the process of salvation being worked out, you know, at the same time. And that that seems to someone who doesn't grasp that contradictory, but it's not. I can give tons of other examples of that same thing you know, going on in, in other roles, you know, I am a father. I became a father when Alexis was born. I'm still working out what it means to be a father 31 years later. You know, that doesn't mean I'm not a father, but it doesn't mean I'm fatherly in, in, in the sense of all that that could mean. You know, I can think of other examples, you know, that are similar to that. Any other thoughts, questions? All right. I'm going to let us finish up a little early then. I, I, this teacher is growing on me uh, in terms of the presenter and the videos. Uh, I like his style. So, uh, yeah, me too. I'm, I'm glad we chose this one. And again, uh, well, I'm familiar with this book. I feel like I'm getting new insights into it that I didn't have before. So, all right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, guys, so we can. I'll do two things. I'm going to stop the share. And then I'm going to stop the recording.